Section 61 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 61. Expedition against Fort Fisher. Attack on the Fort. Failure of the Expedition. Second Expedition against the Fort. Capture of Fort Fisher. Up to January 1865, the enemy occupied Fort Fisher at the mouth of Cape Fear River and below the city of Wilmington. This port was of immense importance to the Confederates because it formed their principal inlet for blockade runners by means of which they brought in from abroad such supplies and munitions of war as they could not produce at home. It was equally important to us to get possession of it, not only because it was desirable to cut off their supplies so as to ensure a speedy termination of the war, but also because foreign governments, particularly the British government, were constantly threatening that, unless ours could maintain the blockade of that coast, they should cease to recognize any blockade. For these reasons I determined, with the concurrence of the Navy Department in December, to send an expedition against Fort Fisher for the purpose of capturing it. To show the difficulty experienced in maintaining the blockade, I will mention a circumstance that took place at Fort Fisher after its fall. Two English blockade runners came in at night. Their commanders, not supposing the fort had fallen, worked their way through all our fleet and got into the river unobserved. They then signaled the fort, announcing their arrival. There was a colored man in the fort who had been there before, and who understood these signals. He informed General Terry what reply he should make to have them come in, and Terry did as he advised. The vessels came in, their officers entirely unconscious that they were falling into the hands of the Union forces. Even after they were brought into the fort, they were entertained in conversation for some little time before suspecting that the Union troops were occupying the fort. They were finally informed that their vessels and cargoes were prizes. I selected General Weitzel of the Army of the James to go with the expedition, but gave instructions through General Butler. He commanded the department within whose geographical limits Fort Fisher was situated, as well as Buford and other points on that coast held by our troops. He was, therefore, entitled to the right of fitting out the expedition against Fort Fisher. General Butler conceived the idea that, if a steamer loaded heavily with powder could be run up to near the shore under the fort and exploded, it would create great havoc and make the capture an easy matter. Admiral Porter, who was to command the naval squadron, seemed to fall in with the idea, and it was not disapproved of in Washington. The Navy was therefore given the task of preparing the steamer for this purpose. I had no confidence in the success of the scheme, and so expressed myself. But, as no serious harm could come of the experiment, and the authorities at Washington seemed desirous to have it tried, I permitted it. The steamer was sent to Buford, North Carolina, and was there loaded with powder and prepared for the part she was to play in the reduction of Fort Fisher. General Butler chose to go in command of the expedition himself, and was all ready to sail by the ninth of December, 1864. Very heavy storms prevailed, however, at that time along that part of the sea coast, and prevented him from getting off until 
the 13th or 14th. His advance arrived off Fort Fisher on the 15th. The naval force had been already assembled, or was assembling, but they were obliged to run into Buford for munitions, coal, etc. Then, too, the powder boat was not yet fully prepared. The fleet was ready to proceed on the 18th, but Butler, who had remained outside from the 15th up to that time, now found himself out of coal, fresh water, etc., and had to put into Buford to replenish. Another storm overtook him, and several days more were lost before the Army and Navy were both ready at the same time to cooperate. On the night of the 23rd, the powder boat was towed in by a gunboat as near to the fort as it was safe to run. She was then propelled by her own machinery to within about 500 yards of the shore. There the clockwork, which was to explode her within a certain length of time, was set and she was abandoned. Everybody left, and even the vessels put out to sea to prevent the effect of the explosion upon them. At two o'clock in the morning the explosion took place, and produced no more effect on the fort or anything else on land than the bursting of a boiler anywhere on the Atlantic Ocean would have done. Indeed, when the troops in Fort Fisher heard the explosion, they supposed it was the bursting of a boiler in one of the Yankee gunboats. Fort Fisher was situated upon a low, flat peninsula north of Cape Fear River. The soil is sandy. Back a little, the peninsula is very heavily wooded and covered with fresh water swamps. The fort ran across this peninsula about 500 yards in width and extended along the sea coast about 1,300 yards. The fort had an armament of 21 guns and 3 mortars on the land side and 24 guns on the sea front. At that time it was only garrisoned by four companies of infantry, one light battery, and the gunners at the heavy guns less than 700 men with a reserve of less than a thousand men five miles up the peninsula. General Whitting of the Confederate Army was in command, and General Bragg was in command of the force at Wilmington. Both commenced calling for reinforcements the moment they saw our troops landing. The governor of North Carolina called for everybody who could stand behind a parapet and shoot a gun to join them. In this way they got two or three hundred additional men into Fort Fisher. An hoax division, five or six thousand strong, was sent down from Richmond. A few of these troops arrived the very day that Butler was ready to advance. On the 24th, the fleet formed for an attack in arcs of concentric circles. Their heavy ironclads going in very close range, being nearest the shore, and leaving intervals or spaces so that the outer vessels could fire between them. Porter was thus enabled to throw 115 shells per minute. The damage done to the fort by these shells was very slight, only two or three cannon being disabled in the fort, but the firing silenced all the guns by making it too hot for the men to maintain their positions about them and compelling them to seek shelter in the bomb-proofs. On the next day, part of Butler's troops, under General Adelbert Ames, effected a landing out of range of the fort without difficulty. This was accomplished under the protection of gunboats sent for the purpose and under cover of a renewed attack upon the fort by the fleet. They formed a line across the peninsula and advanced, part going north and part toward the fort, covering themselves as they did so. Curtis pushed forward and came near to Fort Fisher, capturing the small garrison at what was called the Flag Pond Battery. Weitzel accompanied him to within a half a mile of the works. 
Here he saw that the fort had not been injured, and so reported to Butler, advising against an assault. Ames, who had gone north in his advance, captured 228 of the reserves. These prisoners reported to Butler that 1,600 of Hoke's division of 6,000 from Richmond had already arrived and the rest would soon be in his rear. Upon these reports, Butler determined to withdraw his troops from the peninsula and return to the fleet. At that time, there had not been a man on our side injured except by one of the shells from the fleet. Curtis had got within a few yards of the works. Some of his men had snatched a flag from the parapet of the fort, and others had taken a horse from the inside of the stockade. At night, Butler informed Porter of his withdrawal, giving the reasons above stated, and announced his purpose as soon as his men could embark to start for Hampton Roads. Porter represented to him that he had sent to Buford for more ammunition. He could fire much faster than he had been doing, and would keep the enemy from showing himself until our men were within twenty yards of the fort, and he begged that Butler would leave some brave fellows like those who had snatched the flag from the parapet and taken the horse from the fort. Butler was unchangeable. He got all his troops aboard, except Curtis's brigade, and started back. In doing this, Butler made a fearful mistake. My instructions to him, or to the officer who went in command of the expedition, were explicit in the statement that to effect a landing would be of itself a great victory, and if one should be effected, the foothold must not be relinquished. On the contrary, a regular siege of the fort must be commenced, and to guard against interference by reason of storms, supplies of provisions must be laid in as soon as they could be got on shore. But General Butler seems to have lost sight of this part of his instructions, and was back at Fort Monroe on the 28th. I telegraphed to the President as follows. City Point, Virginia, December 28, 1864, 8.30 p.m. The Wilmington expedition has proven a gross and culpable failure. Many of the troops are back here. Delays and free talk of the object of the expedition enabled the enemy to move troops to Wilmington to defeat it. After the expedition sailed from Fort Monroe, three days of fine weather were squandered, during which the enemy was without a force to protect himself. Who is to blame will, I hope, be known. U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. Porter sent dispatches to the Navy Department, in which he complained bitterly of having been abandoned by the Army just when the fort was nearly in our possession, and begged that our troops might be sent back again to cooperate, but with a different commander. As soon as I heard this, I sent a messenger to Porter with a letter asking him to hold on. I assured him that I fully sympathized with him in his disappointment, and that I would send the same troops back with a different commander, with some reinforcements to offset those which the enemy had received. I told him it would take some little time to get transportation for the additional troops, but as soon as it could be had, the men should be on their way to him, and there would be no delay on my part. I selected A. H. Terry to command. It was the 6th of January before the transports could be got ready and the troops aboard. They sailed from Fortress Monroe on that day. The object and destination of the second expedition were, at the time, kept a secret to all except a few in the Navy Department and in the Army to whom it was necessary to impart the information. General Terry had not the slightest idea of where he was going 
or what he was to do. He simply knew that he was going to see, and that he had his orders with him, which were to be opened when out at sea. He was instructed to communicate freely with Porter, and have entire harmony between Army and Navy, because the work before them would require the best efforts of both arms of service. They arrived off Buford on the 8th. A heavy storm, however, prevented a landing at Fort Fisher until the 13th. The Navy prepared itself for attack about as before, and the same time assisted the Army in landing, this time five miles away. Only ironclads fired at first, the object being to draw the fire of the enemy's guns so as to ascertain their positions. This object being accomplished, they then let in their shots thick and fast. Very soon the guns were all silenced, and the fort showed evident signs of being much injured. Terry deployed his men across the peninsula as had been done before, and at two o'clock on the following morning was up within two miles of the fort with a respectable abatis in front of his line. His artillery was all landed on that day, the 14th. Again, Curtis's brigade of Ames's division had the lead. By noon they had carried an unfinished work less than a half mile from the fort and turned it so as to face the other way terry now saw porter and arranged for an assault on the following day the two commanders arranged their signals so that they could communicate with each other from time to time as they might have occasion at daylight the fleet commenced its firing the time agreed upon for the assault was the middle of the afternoon, and Ames, who commanded the assaulting column, moved at 3.30. Porter landed a force of sailors and marines to move against the sea front in cooperation with Ames's assault. They were under Commander Brees of the Navy. These sailors and marines had worked their way up to within a couple of hundred yards of the fort before the assault. The signal was given and the assault was made, but the poor sailors and marines were repulsed and very badly handled by the enemy, losing 280 killed and wounded out of their number. Curtis's brigade charged successfully, though met by a heavy fire some of the men having to wade through the swamp up to their waists to reach the fort many were wounded of course and some killed but they soon reached the palisades these they cut away and pushed on through the other troops then came up penny packers following curtis and bell who commanded the third brigade of ames's division following penny packer but the fort was not yet captured though the parapet was gained the works were very extensive. The large parapet around the work would have been but very little protection to those inside except when they were close up under it. Traverses had therefore been run until really the work was a succession of small forts enclosed by a large one. The rebels made a desperate effort to hold the fort and had to be driven from these traverses one by one. The fight continued till long after night. Our troops gained first one traverse and then another, and by ten o'clock at night the place was carried. During this engagement the sailors, who had been repulsed in their assault on the bastion, rendered the best service they could by reinforcing Terry's northern line, thus enabling him to send a detachment to the assistance of Ames. The fleet kept up a continuous fire upon that part of the fort, which was still occupied by the enemy. By means of signals, they could be informed where to direct their shots. During the succeeding nights, the enemy blew up Fort Caswell on the opposite side of Cape Fear River, and abandoned two extensive works on Smith's Island in the river. Our captures in all amounted to 169 guns, besides small arms, with full supplies of ammunition, 
and 2,083 prisoners. In addition to these, there were about 700 dead and wounded left there. We had lost 110 killed and 536 wounded. In this assault on Fort Fisher, Bell, one of the brigade commanders, was killed, and two, Curtis and Pennypacker, were badly wounded. Secretary Stanton, who was on his way back from Savannah, arrived off Fort Fisher soon after it fell. When he heard the good news, he promoted all the officers of any considerable rank for their conspicuous gallantry. Terry had been nominated for Major General, but had not been confirmed. This confirmed him, and soon after I recommended him for a brigadier generalcy in the regular army, and it was given to him for this victory. End of section sixty one. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at j o c c l e v dot com. Two of personal memoirs of U. S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant, Chapter 62. Sherman's March North. Sheridan Ordered to Lynchburg can be ordered to move against mobile movements of schofield and thomas capture of columbia south carolina sherman in the carolinas when news of sherman being in possession of savannah reached the north distinguished statesmen and visitors began to pour in to see him among others who went was the secretary of war who seemed much pleased at the result of his campaign. Mr. Draper, the collector of customs of New York, who was with Mr. Staunton's party, was put in charge of the public property that had been abandoned and captured. Savannah was then turned over to General Foster's command to hold, so that Sherman might have his own entire army free to operate as might be decided upon in the future. I sent the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac, General Barnard, with letters to General Sherman. He remained some time with the general, and when he returned brought back letters, one of which contained suggestions from Sherman as to what ought to be done in cooperation with him when he should have started upon his march northward i must not neglect to state here the fact that i had no idea originally of having sherman march from savannah to richmond or even to north carolina the season was bad the roads impassable for anything except such an army as he had and i should not have thought of ordering such a move I had, therefore, made preparations to collect transports to carry Sherman and his army around to the James River by water, and so informed him. On receiving this letter, he went to work immediately to prepare for the move, but seeing that it would require a long time to collect the transports, he suggested the idea, then, of marching up north through the Carolinas. I was only too happy to approve this, for if successful, it promised every advantage. His march through Georgia had thoroughly destroyed all lines of transportation in that state, and had completely cut the enemy off from all sources of supply to the west of it. If North and South Carolina were rendered helpless, so far as capacity for feeding Lee's army was concerned, the Confederate garrison at Richmond would be reduced in territory from which to draw supplies to very narrow limits in the state of Virginia, and although that section of the country was fertile, it was already well exhausted of both forage and food. 
I approved Sherman's suggestion, therefore, at once. The work of preparation was tedious, because supplies, to load the wagons for the march, had to be brought from a long distance. Sherman would now have to march through a country furnishing fewer provisions than that he had previously been operating in during his march to the sea. Besides, he was confronting, or marching toward, a force of the enemy vastly superior to any his troops had encountered on their previous march, and the territory through which he had to pass had now become of such vast importance to the very existence of the Confederate army that the most desperate efforts were to be expected in order to save it. Sherman, therefore, while collecting the necessary supplies to start with, made arrangements with Admiral Dahlgren, who commanded that part of the Navy on the South Carolina and Georgia coast, and General Foster, commanding the troops, to take positions and hold a few points on the sea coast which he, Sherman, designated in the neighborhood of Charleston. This provision was made to enable him to fall back upon the sea coast in case he should encounter a force sufficient to stop his onward progress. He also wrote me a letter, making suggestions as to what he would like to have done in support of his movement further north. This letter was brought to City Point by General Barnard at a time when I happened to be going to Washington City where I arrived on the 21st of January. I cannot tell the provision I had already made to cooperate with Sherman in anticipation of his expected movement better than by giving my reply to this letter. Headquarters, Armies of the United States, Washington, D.C., January 21st, 1865. Major General W. T. Sherman, Commanding Military Division of the Mississippi. General, your letters brought by General Barnard were received at City Point and read with interest. Not having them with me, however, I cannot say that in this I will be able to satisfy you on all points of recommendation, as I arrived here at 1 p.m. and must leave at 6 p.m., having in the meantime spent over three hours with the Secretary and General Halleck, I must be brief. Before your last request to have Thomas make a campaign into the heart of Alabama, I had ordered Schofield to Annapolis, Maryland, with his corps. The advance, 6,000, will reach the seaboard by the 23rd, the remainder following as rapidly as railroad transportation can be procured from Cincinnati. The Corps numbers over 21,000 men. I was induced to do this because I did not believe Thomas could possibly be got off before spring. His pursuit of Hood indicated a sluggishness, that satisfied me that he would never do to conduct one of your campaigns. The command of the advance of the pursuit was left to subordinates, whilst Thomas followed far behind. When Hood had crossed the Tennessee, and those in pursuit had reached it, Thomas had not much more than half crossed the state from whence he returned to Nashville to take steamer for Eastport. He is possessed of excellent judgment, great coolness and honesty, but he is not good on a pursuit. He also reported his troops fagged, and that it was necessary to equip up. This report, and a determination to give the enemy no rest, determined me to use his surplus troops elsewhere. Thomas is still left with a sufficient force surplus to go to Selma under an energetic leader. He has been telegraphed to, to know whether he could go, and if so, which of the several routes he would select. No reply is yet received.
canby has been ordered to act offensively from the sea coast to the interior towards montgomery and selma thomas's forces will move from the north at an early day or some of his troops will be sent to canby without further reinforcements canby will have a moving column of twenty thousand men fort fisher you are aware has been captured we have a force there of eight thousand effective at new Bern, about half the number it is rumored through deserters that wilmington also has fallen i am inclined to believe the rumor because on the seventeenth we knew the enemy were blowing up their works about fort caswell and that on the eighteenth terry moved on wilmington if wilmington is captured schofield will go there if not he will be sent to new Bern. in either event all the surplus forces at the two points will move to the interior toward goldsburg in cooperation with your movements from either point railroad communications can be run out there being here abundance of rolling stock suited to the gauge of those roads there have been about sixteen thousand men sent from lee's army south of these you will have fourteen thousand against you if wilmington is not held by the enemy casualties at fort fisher having overtaken about two thousand all these troops are subject to your orders as you come in communication with them they will be so instructed from about richmond i will watch lee closely and if he detaches much more or attempts to evacuate will pitch in in the meantime should you be brought to a halt anywhere i can send two corps of thirty thousand effective men to your support from the troops about richmond to resume canby is ordered to operate to the interior from the gulf a j smith may go from the north but i think it doubtful a force of twenty eight or thirty thousand will cooperate with you from new Bern or wilmington or both you can call for reinforcements this will be handed you by captain hudson of my staff who will return with any message you may have for me if there is anything i can do for you in the way of having supplies on shipboard at any point on the sea coast ready for you let me know it yours truly u s grant lieutenant general i had written on the eighteenth of january to general sherman giving him the news of the battle of nashville he was much pleased at the result although like myself he had been very much disappointed at thomas for permitting hood to cross the tennessee river and nearly the whole state of tennessee and come to nashville to be attacked there he however as i had done sent thomas a warm congratulatory letter on the tenth of january eighteen sixty five the resolutions of thanks to sherman and his army passed by congress were approved sherman after the capture at once had the debris cleared up commencing the work by removing the piling and torpedoes from the river and taking up all obstructions he had then entrenched the city so that it could be held by a small garrison by the middle of january all his work was done except the accumulation of supplies to commence his movement with he proposed to move in two columns one from savannah going along by the river of the same name and the other by roads further east threatening charleston he commenced the advance by moving his right wing to beaufort south carolina then to pocotaligo by water this column in moving north threatened charleston and indeed it was not determined at first that they would have a force visit charleston south carolina had done so much to prepare the public mind of the south for secession and had been so active 
in precipitating the decision of the question before the South was fully prepared to meet it, that there was, at that time, a feeling throughout the North, and also largely entertained by people of the South, that the state of South Carolina and Charleston, the hotbed of secession in particular, ought to have a heavy hand laid upon them. In fact, nothing but the decisive results that followed deterred the radical portion of the people from condemning the movement, because Charleston had been left out. To pass into the interior would, however, be to ensure the evacuation of the city and its possession by the Navy and Foster's troops. It is so situated between two formidable rivers that a small garrison could have held it against all odds as long as their supplies would hold out. Sherman, therefore, passed it by. By the 1st of February, all preparations were completed for the final march. Columbia, South Carolina, being the first objective, Fayetteville, North Carolina, the second, and Goldsboro, or neighborhood, the final one, unless something further should be determined upon. The right wing went from Pocotaligo, and the left from about Hardyville on the Savannah River both columns taking a pretty direct route for columbia the cavalry however were to threaten charleston on the right and augusta on the left on the fifteenth of january fort fisher had fallen news of which sherman had received before starting out on his march we already had new Bern, and had soon wilmington whose fall followed that of fort fisher as did other points on the sea coast where the national troops were now in readiness to cooperate with sherman's advance when he had passed fayetteville on the eighteenth of january i ordered canby in command at new orleans to move against mobile montgomery and selma alabama for the purpose of destroying roads machine shops etc on the 8th of February, I ordered Sheridan, who was in the Valley of Virginia, to push forward as soon as the weather would permit, and strike the canal west of Richmond at, or about, Lynchburg, and on the 20th, I made the order to go to Lynchburg as soon as the roads would permit, saying, as soon as it is possible to travel, I think you will have no difficulty about reaching Lynchburg with a cavalry force alone. From there, you could destroy the railroad and canal in every direction, so as to be of no further use to the rebellion. This additional raid, with one starting from East Tennessee under Stoneman, numbering about four or five thousand cavalry, one from Eastport, Mississippi, 10,000 cavalry, Canby from Mobile Bay with about 18,000 mixed troops, these three latter pushing for Tuscaloosa, Selma, and Montgomery, and Sherman with a large army eating out the vitals of South Carolina is all that will be wanted to leave nothing for the rebellion to stand upon. I would advise you to overcome great obstacles to accomplish this. Charleston was evacuated on Tuesday last. On the 27th of February, more than a month after Canby had received his orders, I again wrote to him saying that I was extremely anxious to hear of his being in Alabama. I notified him also that I had sent Grierson to take command of his cavalry, he being a very efficient officer. I further suggested that Forrest was probably in Mississippi, and if he was there, he would find him an officer of great courage and capacity whom it would be difficult to get by. I still further informed him that Thomas had been ordered to start a cavalry force into Mississippi on the 20th of February, or as soon as possible thereafter. This force did not get off, however, 
All these movements were designed to be in support of Sherman's march, the object being to keep the Confederate troops in the west from leaving there. But neither Canby nor Thomas could be got off in time. I had some time before depleted Thomas's army to reinforce Canby, for the reason that Thomas had failed to start an expedition which he had been ordered to send out, and to have the troops where they might do something. Canby seemed to be equally deliberate in all of his movements. I ordered him to go in person, but he prepared to send a detachment under another officer. General Granger had got down to New Orleans in some way or other, and I wrote Canby that he must not put him in command of troops. In spite of this, he asked the War Department to assign Granger to the command of a corps. Almost in despair of having adequate service rendered to the cause in that quarter, I said to Canby, I am in receipt of a dispatch informing me that you have made requisitions for a construction corps and materiel to build seventy miles of railroad. I have directed that none be sent. Thomas's army has been depleted to send a force to you that they might be where they could act in winter and at least detain the force the enemy had in the west. If there had been any idea of repairing railroads, it could have been done much better from the north, where we already had the troops. I expected your movements to be cooperative with Sherman's last. This has now entirely failed. I wrote to you long ago, urging you to push promptly and to live upon the country and destroy railroads, machine shops, etc., not to build them take mobile and hold it and push your forces to the interior to montgomery and to selma destroy railroads rolling stock and everything useful for carrying on war and when you have done this take such positions as can be supplied by water by this means alone you can occupy positions from which the enemy's roads in the interior can be kept broken. Most of these expeditions got off finally, but too late to render any service in the direction for which they were designed. The enemy, ready to intercept his advance, consisted of Hardy's troops and Wheeler's cavalry, perhaps less than 15,000 men in all, but frantic efforts were being made in Richmond, as I was sure would be the case, to retard Sherman's movements. Everything possible was being done to raise troops in the South. Lee dispatched against Sherman the troops which had been sent to relieve Fort Fisher, which, including those of the other defenses of the harbor and its neighborhood, amounted, after deducting the 2,000 killed, wounded, and captured, to 14,000 men. After Thomas's victory at Nashville, what remained of Hood's army were gathered together and forwarded as rapidly as possible to the east to cooperate with these forces, and finally General Joseph E. Johnston, one of the ablest commanders of the South, though not in favor with the administration, or at least with Mr. Davis, was put in command of all the troops in North and South Carolina. Schofield arrived at Annapolis in the latter part of January, but before sending his troops to North Carolina, I went with him down the coast to see the situation of affairs, as I could give fuller directions after being on the ground than I could very well have given without. We soon returned, and the troops were sent by sea to Cape Fear River. Both New Bern and Wilmington are connected with Raleigh by railroads which unite at Goldsboro. Schofield was to land troops at Smithville, near the mouth of the Cape Fear River, 
on the west side, and move up to secure the Wilmington and Charlottesville Railroad, this column took their pontoon bridges with them to enable them to cross over to the island south of the city of Wilmington. A large body was sent by the north side to cooperate with them. They succeeded in taking the city on the 22nd of February. I took the precaution to provide for Sherman's army in case he should be forced to turn in toward the sea coast before reaching North Carolina by forwarding supplies to every place where he was liable to have to make such a deflection from his projected march. I also sent railroad rolling stock, of which we had a great abundance now that we were not operating the roads in Virginia, the gauge of the North Carolina railroads being the same as the Virginia railroads had been altered too. These cars and locomotives were ready for use there without any change. On the 31st of January, I countermanded the orders given to Thomas to move south to Alabama and Georgia. I had previously reduced his force by sending a portion of it to Terry. I directed in lieu of this movement that he should send Stoneman through East Tennessee and push him well down toward Columbia, South Carolina, in support of Sherman. Thomas did not get Stoneman off in time, but, on the contrary, when I had supposed he was on his march in support of Sherman, I heard of his being in Louisville, Kentucky. I immediately changed the order and directed Thomas to send him toward Lynchburg. Finally, however, on the 12th of March, he did push down through the northwestern end of South Carolina, creating some consternation. I also ordered Thomas to send the 4th Corps, Stanley's, to Bull Gap and to destroy no more roads east of that. I also directed him to concentrate supplies at Knoxville with a view to a probable movement of his army through that way toward Lynchburg. Goldsboro is 425 miles from Savannah. Sherman's march was without much incident until he entered Columbia on the 17th of February. He was detained in his progress by having to repair and corduroy the roads and rebuild the bridges. There was constant skirmishing and fighting between the cavalry of the two armies, but this did not retard the advance of the infantry. Four days, also, were lost in making complete the destruction of the most important railroads south of Columbia, there was also some delay caused by the high water and the destruction of the bridges on the line of the road. A formidable river had to be crossed near Columbia, and that in the face of a small garrison under General Wade Hampton. There was but little delay, however, further than that caused by high water in the stream. Hampton left as Sherman approached, and the city was found to be on fire. There has since been a great deal of acrimony displayed in discussions of the question as to who set Columbia on fire. Sherman denies it on the part of his troops, and Hampton denies it on the part of the Confederates. One thing is certain. As soon as our troops took possession, they at once proceeded to extinguish the flames to the best of their ability, with the limited means at hand. In any case, the example set by the Confederates in burning the village of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, a town which was not garrisoned, would seem to make a defense of the act of firing the seat of government of the state most responsible for the conflict then raging, not imperative, the Confederate troops having vacated the city, the mayor took possession, 
and sallied forth to meet the commander of the national forces for the purpose of surrendering the town making terms for the protection of property etc sherman paid no attention at all to the overture but pushed forward and took the town without making any conditions whatever with its citizens he then however cooperated with the mayor in extinguishing the flames and providing for the people who were rendered destitute by this destruction of their homes when he left there he even gave the mayor five hundred head of cattle to be distributed among the citizens to tide them over until some arrangement could be made for their future supplies he remained in columbia until the roads public buildings workshops and everything that could be useful to the enemy were destroyed while at columbia sherman learned for the first time that what remained of hood's army was confronting him under the command of general beauregard charleston was evacuated on the eighteenth of february and foster garrisoned the place wilmington was captured on the twenty second columbia and chira further north were regarded as so secure from invasion that the wealthy people of charleston and augusta had sent much of their valuable property to these two points to be stored among the goods sent there were valuable carpets tons of old madeira silverware and furniture i am afraid much of these goods fell into the hands of our troops there was found at columbia a large amount of powder some artillery small arms and fixed ammunition these of course were among the articles destroyed while here sherman also learned of johnston's restoration to command the latter was given as already stated all troops in north and south carolina after the completion of the destruction of public property about columbia sherman proceeded on his march and reached chiraw without any special opposition and without incident to relate the railroads of course were thoroughly destroyed on the way sherman remained a day or two at chiraw and finally on the sixth of march crossed his troops over the p d and advanced straight for fayetteville hardy and hampton were there and barely escaped sherman reached fayetteville on the eleventh of march he had dispatched scouts from chiraw with letters to general terry at wilmington asking him to send a steamer with some supplies of bread clothing and other articles which he enumerated the scouts got through successfully, and a boat was sent with the mail and such articles for which Sherman had asked as were in store at Wilmington. Unfortunately, however, these stores did not contain clothing. Four days later, on the 15th, Sherman left Fayetteville for Goldsboro. The march, now, had to be made with great caution, for he was approaching Lee's army, and nearing the country that still remained open to the enemy besides he was confronting all that he had had to confront in his previous march up to that point reinforced by the garrisons along the road and by what remained of hood's army frantic appeals were made to the people to come in voluntarily and swell the ranks of our foe i presume however that johnston did not have in all over thirty-five or forty thousand men the people had grown tired of the war and desertions from the confederate army were much more numerous than the voluntary accessions there was some fighting at averysboro on the sixteenth between johnston's troops and sherman's with some loss and at bentonville on the nineteenth and twenty-first of march but johnston withdrew from the contest before the morning of the twenty-second 
Sherman's loss in these last engagements in killed, wounded, and missing was about 1,600. Sherman's troops at last reached Goldsboro on the 23rd of the month and went into bivouac and there his men were destined to have a long rest. Schofield was there to meet him with the troops which had been sent to Wilmington. Sherman was no longer in danger. He had Johnston confronting him, but with an army much inferior to his own, both in numbers and morale. He had Lee to the north of him, with a force largely superior, but i was holding lee with a still greater force and had he made his escape and gotten down to reinforce johnston sherman with the reinforcements he now had from schofield and terry would have been able to hold the confederates at bay for an indefinite period he was near the seashore with his back to it and our navy occupied the harbors he had a railroad to both Wilmington and New Bern, and his flanks were thoroughly protected by streams, which intersect that part of the country, and deepen as they approach the sea. Then, too, Sherman knew that if Lee should escape me, I would be on his heels, and he and Johnson together would be crushed in one blow if they attempted to make a stand. With the loss of their capital... It is doubtful whether Lee's army would have amounted to much as an army when it reached North Carolina. Johnston's army was demoralized by constant defeat and would hardly have made an offensive movement even if they could have been induced to remain on duty. The men of both Lee's and Johnston's armies were, like their brethren of the North, as brave as men can be. But no man is so brave that he may not meet such defeats and disasters as to discourage him and dampen his ardor for any cause, no matter how just he deems it. End of section 62. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. Sixty three of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter sixty three. Arrival of the Peace Commissioners. Lincoln and the Peace Commissioners, an anecdote of Lincoln, the winter before Petersburg, Sheridan destroys the railroad, Gordon carries the picket line, Park recaptures the line, the line of battle of White Oak Road. On the last of January, 1865, Peace commissioners from the so-called Confederate states presented themselves on our lines around Petersburg and were immediately conducted to my headquarters at City Point. They proved to be Alexander H. Stevens, Vice President of the Confederacy, Judge Campbell, Assistant Secretary of War, and R. M. T. Hunt, formerly United States Senator and then a member of the Confederate Senate. It was about dark when they reached my headquarters, and I at once conducted them to the steam Mary Martin, a Hudson River boat which was very comfortably fitted up for the use of passengers. I at once communicated by telegraph with Washington, and informed the Secretary of War and the President of the arrival of these commissioners, and that their object was to negotiate terms of peace between the United States and, as they termed it, the Confederate government. I was instructed to retain them at City Point until the President 
or some one whom he would designate should come to meet them they remained several days as guests on board the boat i saw them quite frequently though i have no recollection of having had any conversation whatever with them on the subject of their mission it was something i had nothing to do with and i therefore did not wish to express any views on the subject for my own part i never had admitted and never was ready to admit that they were the representatives of a government there had been too great a waste of blood and treasure to concede anything of the kind as long as they remained there however our relations were pleasant and i found them all very agreeable gentlemen i directed the captain to furnish them with the best the boat afforded and to administer to their comfort in every way possible no guard was placed over them and no restriction was put upon their movements nor was there any pledge asked that they would not abuse the privileges extended to them they were permitted to leave the boat when they felt like it and did so coming up on the bank and visiting me at my headquarters i had never met either of these gentlemen before the war but knew them well by reputation and through their public services and i had been a particular admirer of mr stevens i had always supposed that he was a very small man but when i saw him in the dusk of the evening i was very much surprised to find so large a man as he seemed to be when he got down on to the boat i found that he was wearing a coarse gray woolen overcoat a manufacture that had been introduced into the south during the rebellion the cloth was thicker than anything of the kind i had ever seen even in canada the overcoat extended nearly to his feet and was so large that it gave him the appearance of being an average sized man he took this off when he reached the cabin of the boat and i was struck with the apparent change in size in the coat and out of it after a few days about the second of february i received a dispatch from washington directing me to send the commissioners to hampton roads to meet the president and a member of the cabinet mr lincoln met them there and had an interview of short duration it was not a great while after they met that the president visited me at city point he spoke of his having met the commissioners and said he had told them that there would be no use in entering into any negotiations unless they would recognize first that the union as a whole must be forever preserved and second that slavery must be abolished if they were willing to concede these two points then he was ready to enter into negotiations and was almost willing to hand them a blank sheet of paper with his signature attached for them to fill in the terms upon which they were willing to live with us in the union and be one people he always showed a generous and kindly spirit toward the southern people and i never heard him abuse an enemy some of the cruel things said about president lincoln particularly in the north used to pierce him to the heart but never in my presence did he invent a revengeful disposition and i saw a great deal of him at city point for he seemed glad to get away from the cares and anxieties of the capital right here i might relate an anecdote of mr lincoln it was on the occasion of his visit to me just after he had talked with the peace commissioners at hampton roads after a little conversation he asked me if i had seen that overcoat of stevens's i replied that i had well said he did you see him take it off i said yes well said he didn't you think it was the biggest shuck and the littlest ear that ever you did see
Long afterwards I told this story to the Confederate General J. B. Gordon, at the time a member of the Senate. He repeated it to Stevens, and, as I heard afterwards, Stevens laughed immoderately at the simile of Mr. Lincoln. The rest of the winter, after the departure of the peace commissioners, passed off quietly and uneventfully, except for two or three little incidents. On one occasion, during this period, while I was visiting Washington City for the purpose of conferring with the administration, the enemy's cavalry under General Wade Hampton, passing our extreme left and then going to the south, got in east of us. Before their presence was known, they had driven off a large number of beef cattle that were grazing in that section. It was a fair capture, and they were sufficiently needed by the Confederates. It was only retaliating for what we had done, sometimes for many weeks at a time, when out of supplies taking what the Confederate army otherwise would have gotten. As appears in this book, on one single occasion we captured 5,000 head of cattle which were crossing the Mississippi River near Port Hudson on their way from Texas to supply the Confederate army in the east. One of the most anxious periods of my experience during the rebellion was the last few weeks before Petersburg. I felt that the situation of the Confederate army was such that they would try to make an escape at the earliest practicable moment, and I was afraid every morning that I would awake from my sleep to hear that Lee had gone, and that nothing was left but a picket line. He had his railroad by the way of Danville south, and I was afraid that he was running off his men and all stores and ordnance except such as it would be necessary to carry with him for his immediate defense. I knew he could move much more lightly and more rapidly than I, and that, if he got to start, he would leave me behind so that we would have the same army to fight again farther south, and the war might be prolonged another year. I was led to this fear by the fact that I could not see how it was possible for the Confederates to hold out much longer where they were. There is no doubt that Richmond would have been evacuated much sooner than it was, if it had not been that it was the capital of the so-called confederacy and the fact of evacuating the capital would of course have had a very demoralizing effect upon the confederate army when it was evacuated as we shall see further on the confederacy at once began to crumble and fade away then too desertions were taking place not only among those who were with General Lee in the neighborhood of their capital, but throughout the whole Confederacy. I remember that in a conversation with me on one occasion, long prior to this, General Butler remarked that the Confederates would find great difficulty in getting more men for their army, possibly adding, though I am not certain as to this, unless they should arm the slave the south as we all knew were conscripting every able-bodied man between the ages of eighteen and forty-five and now they had passed a law for the further conscription of boys from fourteen to eighteen calling them the junior reserves and men from forty-five to sixty to be called the senior reserves the latter were to hold the necessary points not in immediate danger, and especially those in the rear. General Butler, in alluding to this conscription, remarked that they were thus robbing both the cradle and the grave, an expression which I afterwards used in writing a letter to Mr. Washburn. It was my belief that while the enemy could get no more recruits, they were losing at least a regiment a day, taking it throughout the entire army, by desertions alone. Then, by casualties of war, sickness, and other natural causes, their losses were much heavier. 
it was a mere question of arithmetic to calculate how long they could hold out while that rate of depletion was going on of course long before their army would be thus reduced to nothing the army which we had in the field would have been able to capture theirs then too i knew from the great number of desertions that the men who had fought so bravely so gallantly and so long for the cause which they believed in and as earnestly, I take it, as our men believed in the cause for which they were fighting, had lost hope and become despondent. Many of them were making application to be sent north, where they might get employment until the war was over, when they could return to their southern homes. For these and other reasons, I was naturally very impatient for the time to come, when I could commence the spring campaign, which I thoroughly believed would close the war. There were two considerations I had to observe, however, and which detained me. One was the fact that the winter had been one of heavy rains, and the roads were impassable for artillery and teams. It was necessary to wait until they had dried sufficiently to enable us to move the wagon trains and artillery necessary to the efficiency of an army operating in the enemy's country the other consideration was that general sheridan with the cavalry of the army of the potomac was operating on the north side of the james river having come down from the shenandoah it was necessary that i should have his cavalry with me and I was therefore obliged to wait until he could join me south of the James River. Let us now take account of what he was doing. On the 5th of March I had heard from Sheridan. He had met early between Staunton and Charlottesville, and defeated him, capturing nearly his entire command. Early and some of his officers escaped by finding refuge in the neighboring houses or in the woods. On the 12th I heard from him again. He had turned east to come to White House. He could not go to Lynchburg as ordered because the rains had been so very heavy and the streams were so very much swollen. He had a pontoon train with him but it would not reach halfway across some of the streams at their then stage of water which he would have to get over in going south as first ordered i had supplies sent around to white house for him and kept the depot there open until he arrived we had intended to abandon it because the james river had now become our base of supplies Sheridan had about 10,000 cavalry with him, divided into two divisions, commanded respectively by Custer and Devon. General Merritt was acting as chief of cavalry. Sheridan moved very light, carrying only four days' provisions with him, with a larger supply of coffee, salt, and other small rations, and a very little else besides ammunition. They stopped at Charlottesville and commenced tearing up the railroad back toward Lynchburg. He also sent a division along the James River Canal to destroy locks, culverts, etc. All mills and factories along the lines of march of his troops were destroyed also. Sheridan had in this way consumed so much time that his making a march to white house was now somewhat hazardous he determined therefore to fight his way along the railroad and canal till he was as near to richmond as it was possible to get or until attacked he did this destroying the canal as far as goochland and the railroad to a point as near richmond as he could get on the tenth he was at columbia negroes had joined his column to the number of two thousand or more and they assisted considerably in the work of destroying the railroads and the canal his cavalry was in as fine a condition as when he started 
because he had been able to find plenty of forage. He had captured most of Early's horses and picked up a good many others on the road. When he reached Ashland, he was assailed by the enemy in force. He resisted their assault with part of his command, moved quickly across the south and north Anna, going north, and reached White House safely on the 19th. The time for Sherman to move had to be fixed with reference to the time he could get away from Goldsboro, where he then was. Supplies had to be got up to him, which would last him through a long march, as there would probably not be much to be obtained in the country through which he would pass. I had to arrange, therefore, that he should start from where he was, in the neighborhood of Goldsboro, on the 18th of April, the earliest day at which he supposed he could be ready. Sherman was anxious that I should wait where I was until he could come up and make a sure thing of it, but I had determined to move as soon as the roads and weather would admit of my doing so. I had been tied down somewhat in the matter of fixing any time at my pleasure for starting, until Sheridan, who was on his way from the Shenandoah Valley to join me, should arrive, as both his presence and that of his cavalry were necessary to the execution of the plans which I had in mind. However, having arrived at White House on the 19th of March, I was enabled to make my plans. Prompted by my anxiety, lest Lee should get away some night before I was aware of it, and having the lead of me push into North Carolina to join with Johnston in attempting to crush out Sherman, I had, as early as the first of the month of March, given instructions to the troops around Petersburg to keep a sharp lookout to see that such a movement should not escape their notice, and to be ready, strike at once, if it was undertaken. It is now known that early in the month of March, Mr. Davis and General Lee had a consultation about the situation of affairs in and about and Petersburg, and they both agreed places were no longer tenable for them, and that they must get away as soon as possible. They, too, were waiting for dry roads or a condition of the roads which would make it possible to move. General Lee, in aid of his plan of escape, and to secure a wider opening to enable them to reach the Danville Road with greater security than he would have in the way the two armies were situated, determined upon an assault upon the right of our lines around Petersburg. The night of the 24th of March was fixed upon for this assault, and General Gordon was assigned to the execution of the plan. The point between Fort Stedman and Battery No. 10, where our lines were closest together, was selected as the point of his attack. The attack was to be made at night, and the troops were to get possession of the higher ground in the rear, where they supposed we had entrenchments, then sweep to the right and left, create a panic in the lines of our army, and force me to contract my lines. Lee hoped this would detain me a few days longer, and give him an opportunity of escape. The plan was well conceived, and the execution of it very well done indeed, up to the point of carrying a portion of our line. Gordon assembled his troops under the cover of night, at the point at which they were to make their charge, and got possession of our picket line entirely without the knowledge of the troops inside of our main line of entrenchments, this reduced the distance he would have to charge over to not much more than fifty yards. For some time before, the deserters had been coming in with great frequency, often bringing their arms with them, and this the Confederate general knew. Taking advantage of this knowledge, he sent his pickets with their arms 
creeping through to ours as if to desert. When they got to our lines, they at once took possession and sent our pickets to the rear as prisoners. In the main line our men were sleeping serenely, as if in great security. This plan was to have been executed, and much damage done before daylight, but the troops that were to reinforce Gordon had to be brought from the north side of the James River, and, by some accident on the railroad on their way over, they were detained for a considerable time, so that it got to be nearly daylight before they were ready to make the charge. The charge, however, was successful and almost without loss. The enemy passing through our lines between Fort Stedman and Battery No. 10, then turning to the right and left, they captured the fort and the battery, with all the arms and troops in them. Continuing the charge, they also carried batteries 11 and 12 to our left, which they turned toward City Point. Meade happened to be at City Point that night, and this break in his line cut him off from all communication with his headquarters. Park, however, commanding the Ninth Corps when this breach took place, telegraphed the facts to Meade's headquarters, and learning that the general was away, assumed command himself, and with commendable promptitude, made all preparations to drive the enemy back. General Tidball gathered a large number of pieces of artillery and planted them in rear of the captured works so as to sweep the narrow space of ground between the lines very thoroughly. Hartraft was soon out with his division, as also was Wilcox. Hartraft, to the right of the breach, headed the rebels off in that direction, and rapidly drove them back into Fort Stedman. On the other side, they were driven back into the entrenchments which they had captured, and batteries 11 and 12 were retaken by Wilcox early in the morning. Park then threw a line around outside of the captured fort and batteries, and communication was once more established. The artillery fire was kept up so continuously that it was impossible for the Confederates to retreat, and equally impossible for reinforcements to join them. They all, therefore, fell captives into our hands. This effort of Lee's cost him about 4,000 men, and resulted in their killing, wounding, and capturing about 2,000 of ours. After the recapture of the batteries taken by the Confederates, our troops made a charge and carried the enemy's entrenched picket line, which they strengthened and held. This, in turn, gave us but a short distance to charge over when our attack came to be made a few days later. The day that Gordon was making dispositions for this attack, 24th of March, I issued my orders for the movement to commence on the 29th. Ord, with three divisions of infantry and Mackenzie's cavalry, was to move in advance on the night of the 27th from the north side of the James River and take his place on our extreme left, 30 miles away. He left Weitzel with the rest of the Army of the James to hold Bermuda Hundred, and the north of the James River. The engineer brigade was to be left at City Point, and Park's corps in the lines about Petersburg. Ord was at his place promptly. Humphreys and Warren were then on our extreme left with the second and fifth corps. They were directed on the arrival of Ord, and on his getting into position in their places, to cross Hatcher's Run and extend out west toward Five Forks, the object being to get into a position from which we could strike the South Side Railroad and ultimately the Danville Railroad. There was considerable fighting in taking up these new positions for the 2nd and 5th Corps, 
in which the army of the james had also to participate somewhat and the losses were quite severe this was what was known as the battle of white oak road end of section sixty three recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 64. Interview with Sheridan. Grand Movement of the Army of the Potomac. Sheridan's Advance on Five Forks. Battle of Five Forks. Park and Wright Storm the Enemy's Line. Battles Before Petersburg. Sheridan reached City Point on the 26th day of March. His horses, of course, were jaded, and many of them had lost their shoes. A few days of rest were necessary to recuperate the animals, and also to have them shod and put in condition for moving. Immediately on General Sheridan's arrival at City Point, I prepared his instructions for the move which I had decided upon. The movement was to commence on the 29th of the month. After reading the instructions I had given him, Sheridan walked out of my tent, and I followed to have some conversation with him by himself, not in the presence of anybody else, even of a member of my staff. In preparing his instructions, I contemplated just what took place. That is to say, capturing five forks, driving the enemy from Petersburg and Richmond, and terminating the contest before separating from the enemy. But the nation had already become restless and discouraged at the prolongation of the war, and many believed that it would never terminate except by compromise, knowing that unless my plan proved an entire success, it would be interpreted as a disastrous defeat. I provided in these instructions that, in a certain event, he was to cut loose from the Army of the Potomac and his base of supplies, and, living upon the country, proceed south by the way of the Danville Railroad, or near it, across the Roanoke, get in the rear of Johnston, who was guarding that road, and cooperate with Sherman in destroying Johnston. Then, with these combined forces, to help carry out the instructions which Sherman already had received, to act in cooperation with the armies around Petersburg and Richmond. I saw that after Sheridan had read his instructions, he seemed somewhat disappointed at the idea, possibly, of having to cut loose again from the Army of the Potomac and place himself between the two main armies of the enemy. I said to him, General, this portion of your instructions I have put in merely as a blind, and gave him the reason for doing so, heretofore described. I told him that, as a matter of fact, I intended to close the war right here, with this movement, and that he should go no farther. His face at once brightened up, and, slapping his hand on his leg, he said, I am glad to hear it, and we can do it. Sheridan was not, however, to make his movement against Five Forks until he got further instructions from me. One day, after the movement I am about to describe had commenced, and when his cavalry was on our extreme left and far to the rear, south, Sheridan rode up to where my headquarters were then established at Dabney's Mills. He met some of my staff officers outside, and was highly jubilant over the prospects of success, giving reasons why he believed this would prove the final and successful effort. 
although my chief of staff had urged very strongly that we return to our position about city point and in the lines around petersburg he asked sheridan to come in to see me and say to me what he had been saying to them sheridan felt a little modest about giving his advice where it had not been asked so one of my staff came in and told me that sheridan had what they considered important news and suggested that i send for him i did so and was glad to see the spirit of confidence with which he was imbued knowing as i did from experience of what great value that feeling of confidence by a commander was i determined to make a movement at once although on account of the rains which had fallen after i had started out the roads were still very heavy orders were given accordingly finally the twenty ninth of march came and fortunately there having been a few days free from rain the surface of the ground was dry giving indications that the time had come when we could move on that date i moved out with all the army available after leaving sufficient force to hold the line about petersburg it soon set in raining again however and in a very short time the roads became practically impassable for teams and almost so for cavalry sometimes a horse or mule would be standing apparently on firm ground when all at once one foot would sink and as he commenced scrambling to catch himself all his feet would sink and he would have to be drawn by hand out of the quicksands so common in that part of virginia and other southern states it became necessary therefore to build corduroy roads every foot of the way as we advanced to move our artillery upon the army had become so accustomed to this kind of work and were so well prepared for it that it was done very rapidly the next day march thirtieth we had made sufficient progress to the southwest to warrant me in starting sheridan with his cavalry over by dinwiddie with instructions to then come up by the road leading northwest to five forks thus menacing the right of lee's line this movement was made for the purpose of extending our lines to the west as far as practicable towards the enemy's extreme right or five forks the column moving detached from the army still in the trenches was excluding the cavalry very small the forces in the trenches were themselves extending to the left flank warren was on the extreme left when the extension began but humphreys was marched around later and thrown into the line between him and five forks my hope was that sheridan would be able to carry five forks get on the enemy's right flank and rear and force them to weaken their center to protect their right so that an assault in the center might be successfully made general wright's corps had been designated to make this assault which i intended to order as soon as information reached me of sheridan's success he was to move under cover as close to the enemy as he could get it is natural to suppose that lee would understand my design to be to get up to the south side and ultimately to the danville railroad as soon as he had heard of the movement commenced on the twenty ninth these roads were so important to his very existence while he remained in richmond and petersburg and of such vital importance to him even in case of retreat that naturally he would make most strenuous efforts to defend them he did on the thirtieth send picket with five brigades to reinforce five forks he also sent around to the right of his army some two or three other divisions besides directing that other troops be held in readiness on the north side of the james river to come over on call he came over himself to superintend in person 
the defense of his right flank. Sheridan moved back to Dinwiddie Courthouse on the night of the 30th, and then took a road leading northwest to Five Forks. He had only his cavalry with him. Soon encountering the rebel cavalry, he met with a very stout resistance. He gradually drove them back, however, until in the neighborhood of Five Forks. Here he had to encounter other troops besides those he had been contending with, and was forced to give way. In this condition of affairs, he notified me of what had taken place, and stated that he was falling back toward Dinwiddie, gradually and slowly, and asked me to send Wright's corps to his assistance. I replied to him that it was impossible to send Wright's corps because that corps was already in line, close up to the enemy, where we should want to assault when the proper time came, and was, besides, a long distance from him. But the second, Humphreys, and fifth, Warren's corps, were on our extreme left, and a little to the rear of it, in a position to threaten the left flank of the enemy at Five Forks, and that I would send Warren. Accordingly, orders were sent to Warren to move at once that night, the 31st, to Dinwiddie Courthouse and put himself in communication with Sheridan as soon as possible and report to him. He was very slow in moving, some of his troops not starting until after five o'clock next morning. When he did move, it was done very deliberately and on arriving at Gravelly Run he found the stream swollen from the recent rains, so that he regarded it as not fordable. Sheridan, of course, knew of his coming, and being impatient to get the troops up as soon as possible, sent orders to him to hasten. He was also hastened, or at least ordered to move up rapidly, by General Meade. He now felt that he could not cross that creek without bridges, and his orders were changed to move so as to strike the pursuing enemy in flank, or get in their rear. But he was so late in getting up, that Sheridan determined to move forward without him. However, Ayres's division of Warren's corps reached him in time to be in the fight all day most of the time separated from the remainder of the fifth corps and fighting directly under sheridan warren reported to sheridan about eleven o'clock on the first but the whole of his troops were not up so as to be much engaged until late in the afternoon griffin's division in backing to get out of the way of a severe crossfire of the enemy was found marching away from the fighting. This did not continue long, however. The division was brought back, and with Ayres' division, did most excellent service during the day. Crawford's division, of the same corps, had backed still farther off, and although orders were sent repeatedly to bring it up, it was late before it finally got to where it could be of material assistance. Once there, it did very excellent service. Sheridan succeeded, by the middle of the afternoon or a little later, in advancing up to the point from which to make his designed assault upon Five Forks itself. He was very impatient to make the assault and have it all over before night, because the ground he occupied would be untenable for him in bivouac during the night. Unless the assault was made and was successful, he would be obliged to return to Dinwiddie Courthouse, or even further than that, for the night. It was at this junction of affairs that Sheridan wanted to get Crawford's division in hand, and he also wanted Warren. He sent staff officer after staff officer in search of Warren, directing that general to report to him but they were unable to find him. At all events, Sheridan was unable to get that officer to him. Finally, he went himself, 
he issued an order relieving Warren and assigning Griffin to the command of the 5th Corps. The troops were then brought up and the assault successfully made. I was so much dissatisfied with Warren's dilatory movements in the Battle of White Oak Road and in his failure to reach Sheridan in time that I was very much afraid that at the last moment he would fail Sheridan. He was a man of fine intelligence, great earnestness, quick perception, and could make his dispositions as quickly as any officer under difficulties where he was forced to act. But I had before discovered a defect, which was beyond his control, that was very prejudicial to his usefulness in emergencies like the one just before us. He could see every danger at a glance before he had encountered it. He would not only make preparations to meet the danger which might occur, but he would inform his commanding officer what others should do while he was executing his move. I had sent a staff officer to General Sheridan to call his attention to these defects, and to say that as much as I liked General Warren, now was not a time when we could let our personal feelings for any one stand in the way of success, and if his removal was necessary to success, not to hesitate. It was upon that authorization that Sheridan removed Warren. I was very sorry that it had been done, and regretted still more that I had not long before taken occasion to assign him to another field of duty. It was dusk when our troops, under Sheridan, went over the parapets of the enemy. The two armies were mingled together there for a time in such manner that it was almost a question which one was going to demand the surrender of the other. Soon, however, the enemy broke and ran in every direction. Some six thousand prisoners, besides artillery and small arms in large quantities, falling into our hands. The flying troops were pursued in different directions, the cavalry and 5th Corps under Sheridan pursuing the larger body which moved northwest. This pursuit continued until about nine o'clock at night, when Sheridan halted his troops, and, knowing the importance to him of the part of the enemy's line which had been captured, returned, sending the 5th Corps across Hatcher's Run to just southwest of Petersburg, and facing them toward it. Merritt, with the cavalry, stopped and bivouacked west of Five Forks. This was the condition which affairs were in on the night of the 1st of April. I then issued orders for an assault by Wright and Park at 4 o'clock on the morning of the 2nd. I also ordered the 2nd Corps, General Humphreys, and General Ord with the Army of the James on the left, to hold themselves in readiness to take any advantage that could be taken from weakening in their front. I notified Mr. Lincoln at City Point of the success of the day. In fact, I had reported to him during the day and evening as I got news, because he was so much interested in the movements taking place that I wanted to relieve his mind as much as I could. I notified Weitzel on the north side of the James River, directing him also to keep close up to the enemy and take advantage of the withdrawal of troops from there to promptly enter the city of Richmond. I was afraid that Lee would regard the possession of Five Forks as of so much importance that he would make a last desperate effort to retake it, risking everything upon the cast of a single die. It was for this reason that I had ordered the assault to take place at once, as soon as I had received the news of the capture of Five Forks. The Corps commanders, however, reported that it was so dark that the men could not see to move, and it would be impossible to make the assault then. 
but we kept up a continuous artillery fire upon the enemy around the whole line including that north of the james river until it was light enough to move which was about a quarter to five in the morning at that hour parks and wright's corps moved out as directed brushed the abatis from their front as they advanced under a heavy fire of musketry and artillery and went without flinching directly on till they mounted the parapets and threw themselves inside of the enemy's line park who was on the right swept down to the right and captured a very considerable length of line in that direction but at that point the outer was so near the inner line which closely enveloped the city of petersburg that he could make no advance forward and in fact had a very serious task to turn the lines which he had captured to the defense of his own troops and to hold them but he succeeded in this wright swung around to his left and moved to hatcher's run sweeping everything before him the enemy had traverses in rear of his captured line under cover of which he made something of a stand from one to another as wright moved on but the latter met no serious obstacle as you proceed to the left the outer line becomes gradually much farther from the inner one and along about hatcher's run they must be nearly two miles apart both park and wright captured a considerable amount of artillery and some prisoners wright about three thousand of them in the meantime ord and humphreys in obedience to the instructions they had received had succeeded by daylight or very early in the morning in capturing the entrenched picket lines in their front and before wright got up to that point ord had also succeeded in getting inside the enemy's entrenchments the second corps soon followed and the outer works of petersburg were in the hands of the national troops never to be wrenched from them again when wright reached hatcher's run he sent a regiment to destroy the south side railroad just outside of the city my headquarters were still at dabney's sawmills as soon as i received the news of wright's success i sent dispatches announcing the fact to all points around the line including the troops at bermuda hundred and those on the north side of the james and to the president at city point further dispatches kept coming in and as they did i sent the additional news to these points finding at length that they were all in i mounted my horse to join the troops who were inside the works when i arrived there i rode my horse over the parapet just as wright's three thousand prisoners were coming out i was soon joined inside by general meade and his staff lee made frantic efforts to recover at least part of the lost ground park on our right was repeatedly assaulted but repulsed every effort before noon longstreet was ordered up from the north side of the james river thus bringing the bulk of lee's army around to the support of his extreme right as soon as i learned this i notified weitzel and directed him to keep up close to the enemy and to have hartsuff commanding the bermuda hundred front to do the same thing and if they found any break to go in hartsuff especially should do so for this would separate richmond and petersburg sheridan after he had returned to five forks swept down to petersburg coming in on our left this gave us a continuous line from the appomattox river below the city to the same river above at eleven o'clock not having heard from sheridan i reinforced park with two brigades from city point with this additional force he completed his captured works for better defense and built back from his right so as to protect his flank 
He also carried in and made an abatis between himself and the enemy. Lee brought additional troops and artillery against Park even after this was done, and made several assaults with very heavy losses. The enemy had, in addition to their entrenched line close up to Petersburg, two enclosed works outside of it, Fort Gregg and Fort Whitworth. We thought it had now become necessary to carry them by assault. About one o'clock in the day, Fort Gregg was assaulted by Foster's division of the 24th Corps, Gibbons, supported by two brigades from Ord's command. The battle was desperate, and the national troops were repulsed several times, but it was finally carried, and immediately the troops in Fort Whitworth evacuated the place. The guns of Fort Gregg were turned upon the retreating enemy, and the commanding officer with some sixty of the men of Fort Whitworth surrendered. I had ordered Miles in the morning to report to Sheridan. In moving to execute this order, he came upon the enemy at the intersection of the White Oak Road and the Claiborne Road. The enemy fell back to Sutherland Station on the South Side Road and were followed by Miles. This position, naturally a strong and defensible one, was also strongly entrenched. Sheridan now came up, and Miles asked permission from him to make the assault, which Sheridan gave. By this time, Humphreys had got through the outer works in his front, and came up also, and assumed command over Miles, who commanded a division in his corps. I had sent an order to Humphreys to turn to his right and move towards Petersburg. This order he now got and started off, thus leaving Miles alone. The latter made two assaults, both of which failed, and he had to fall back a few hundred yards. Hearing that Miles had been left in this position, I directed Humphreys to send a division back to his relief. He went himself. Sheridan, before starting to sweep down to Petersburg, had sent Merritt with his cavalry to the west to attack some Confederate cavalry that had assembled there. Merritt drove them north to the Appomattox River. Sheridan then took the enemy at Sutherland Station on the reverse side from where Miles was, and the two together captured the place with a large number of prisoners and some pieces of artillery, and put the remainder, portions of three Confederate corps, to flight. Sheridan followed and drove them until night, when further pursuit was stopped. Miles bivouacked for the night on the ground which he, with Sheridan, had carried so handsomely by assault. I cannot explain the situation here better than by giving my dispatch to City Point that evening. Boydton Road, near Petersburg, April 2, 1865, 4.40 p.m. Colonel T. S. Bowers, City Point. We are now up and have a continuous line of troops, and in a few hours will be entrenched from the Appomattox below Petersburg to the river above. Heath's and Wilcox's divisions, such part of them as were not captured, were cut off from town, either designedly on their part or because they could not help it. Sheridan, with the cavalry and 5th Corps, is above them. Miles's division, 2nd Corps, was sent from the White Oak Road to Sutherland Station on the South Side Railroad where he met them, and at last accounts was engaged with them. Not knowing whether Sheridan would get up in time, General Humphreys was sent with another division from here. The whole captures, since the army started out gunning, will amount to not less than 12,000 men and probably 50 pieces of artillery, I do not know the number of men and guns accurately, however, 
I think the President might come out and pay us a visit tomorrow. U.S. Grant, Lieutenant General. During the night of April 2nd, our line was entrenched from the river above to the river below. I ordered a bombardment to be commenced the next morning at 5 a.m. to be followed by an assault at 6 o'clock. But the enemy evacuated Petersburg early in the morning. End of section 64. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com.